I wasn't in um, I wasn't in that jacuzzi with Bill, but I can testify <laughs> I can testify to the fact that he's been talking about the fifth estate long before twenty eleven. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> so um, what I want to do is um, I, I I'm basically I want to talk about how all of this relates to, to journalism really and just to give a perspective I suppose from mainstream media. I'll focus uh, a bit on something that we produced the Reuters Institute called this Reuters Institute Digital News Report, which you can find if you Google, download. Um, and in terms of what we do, we obviously study sort of journalism and its different manifestations. We have journalists from all over the world <coughs> come and spend some time with us doing research. We also take part in something that's not quite a blog and not quite a newspaper. We, we run the English language version of something called the European Journalism Observatory, which is an attempt to try and bring together um, academic and practitioner perspectives on journalism from across, in that case, about nine countries. So, what I want to talk about basically is uh, academic blogs, uh, journalism and mainstream media, um, whether the crisis in professional journalism and professional media is an opportunity for academic bloggers, talk a little bit about changes in news consumption on the top of the topics of how devices are changing, impacts on brands, engagement, and then draw out some implications. So, um, yeah, so um, I think if you, you know, the first question is, uh, it strikes me, uh, if you're an academic blogger, what's your market? Who are you trying to target? And I think, uh, as we've heard earlier, if you're trying to target other academics, it's a great way to do it, and it's probably a much better way and a more effective way than most academic journals. You'll reach more readers faster, you won't get any ref points, but that's not the only point in life. So um, uh, what you will do is you'll create your kind of community of interest, and it's a really effective way of engaging with that community of interest. And that, in turn, as we heard earlier, can sort of feed into your research more. I'm not sure I've got the terminology right here, but I, I would have said there's another sort of middle ranking thing, what I call generalist intermediaries. And I'm thinking of it from the point of view of um, journalism. But there's lots of other ways of thinking about it. We heard in the previous session this role of mediation is quite important. So from a journalism point of view, this is a very pretty good way, it strikes me, having an academic blog of getting your name out to journalists and other people who are looking to find out who's working on area X or Y. Um, you know, in the old days, journalists used to have sort of dog-eared contact books. Um, now they have electronic ones, and they cruise around the net looking as to who they should interview <coughs> the next time an issue comes up. But I guess, so people who really want to find you will find you, but you also need to think a little bit about how you're going to promote yourself, how you're going to link to your blog, and how you're going to promote what you're doing in social media. And I'll say a bit more about social media. But what I want to really talk about is what's it do in terms of the mass market. So. Um, yeah, everybody knows there's a crisis going on in legacy media organizations, and um, you know, just a few figures here, I could have given you many more. Um, newsroom employment in the US declined a third but from the beginning of the century to 2012. Newspaper sales collapsing in the US and the UK, and many other places, but not in the BRICS. Uh, TV news audiences fragmenting. And there's growth of blogs and online news, and there's lots of new platforms, new devices, and new ways of engaging. So I'll say a few, so the question I suppose, I'll just go through the next few slides and a little bit of data, but the question is, is this the kind of, does this create the great opportunity, uh, the great space into which you can step? So in this digital news report, we looked at how people consume news online, and basically we looked at people who are consuming all different forms of online news, and we found out that lots of people are consuming news on multiple devices and multiple platforms. Uh, as it says here, 33% of people are using digital news on at least two devices, and 9% on three or more devices. So there are lots of new ways of getting news, and one tendency that we're finding is the more devices people have, the more often they consume news, uh, the more often they look at news so multiple times a day. However, if you're on digital, it doesn't mean you're not consuming traditional news. So um, on the left, you see the, sort of the tablet. For the tablet users in our sample, we looked at 11,000 people across nine countries. The tablet users, 81% of them are looking at TV news regularly. 
40, about 50% looking at the newspaper and about 43% radio news. And the similar figures on the mobile on the right. So we're seeing a kind of hybrid environment where people are using new devices, new sources, but they're still hanging on to consumption via traditional platforms. And I won't use the figures here, but if you, the Ofcom figures about, which ask questions about people's main source of news in the UK show that television is still top and every other thing is down much, much lower. Those figures, that's over the, across the board. If you look by age, you see a different picture. But across the board, that's the picture. One of the things we did in this survey, and it's, it looks at nine countries, which you can see listed there, ranging from the UK on the left to Japan on the right. And it's a slightly complicated chart, so I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes talking about it. We asked about news brands, and we said, which news brands have you looked at in the last week in all of these nine countries? And then we categorized them <coughs> by three categories, by what we call traditional news brands. Uh, these are, uh, that would be like the BBC and their online presence, or the New York Times, or the Guardian. The aggregators, things like Google News, uh, MSN, Yahoo, Huffington Post, and social media and blogs. And we basically then, having asked them, we then sort of accumulated all the, in these three different categories. And what you see is you see quite a lot of differences. Um, in most of the countries we look at, the red bar, the traditional news brands, are the ones that people are using most. But if you move to the right and look at Japan, you see something quite interesting. Japan has a very, very strong newspapers. They're not going through the same kind of crisis that uh, British and American newspapers have gone through. Very high levels of circulation. But what you see in Japan, you see the aggregators are ahead of the traditional news brands. And that's largely because Yahoo is the leading news source in Japan, in spite of the fact they have very strong newspapers. So there's a mixed picture here. On the one hand, traditional news brands are ahead in most countries, except Japan. On the other hand, there's lots of other sources um, that people are going to for news. And I'll just give you two slides, one looking at the UK uh, and one looking at the US, to just sort of tease that out in a bit more detail. This is the same data presented a different way and it's basically it's all about how much is the news market shaking up as you move from offline on the right how brands are doing offline to the left how the how brands are doing online the top 10 or a dozen brands on the right no great surprise the most the, the favorite news brand offline is bbc news that's um bbc television news and radio news does very well followed by itv local newspapers sky um, the Guardian doesn't even feature on the right-hand side. It doesn't make it into our top 12, I think, we have there. If you move left, much, much more competitive environment, where if you're an academic blogger, this is where you're playing. And what one sees is the world shakes up a little bit. The Guardian didn't appear on the right-hand side. The Guardian, in the week we did our survey, 8% of our people have looked at The Guardian. Um, the Sun, best-selling newspaper in Britain until recently, 15% uh, on the right-hand side. Um, the Sun, 5% online on the left-hand side, below the Huffington Post. Huffington Post didn't exist two, three years ago in the UK. So one sees, on the previous slide, I say traditional news brands <laughs> doing well, relatively, but they're doing well in a highly turbulent market, whereas you move online, brands and uh, brand loyalties change. Uh, that's just the Huffington Post. Similar in America, if we look at some, um, actually it's different in America, because you have weaker national brands, so you have local television news on the right, offline, Fox News, local newspapers, uh, CNN, MSN, NBC. Look on the left, Yahoo at the top, Fox News still there, Huffington Post, CNN, MNS, and the rest further down. New York Times, 9% um, uh, on the left, doing better online than it is in the newspaper but then it's much more easily available across the states than it, is, um, than it is there. So I suppose, as I say, my point is that you move, um, the move online for news organizations creates a lot of threats. It also creates some opportunities, hence the Guardian that I showed before. But if one moves and asks a question about what do you trust most as your source of news, these are just UK figures only, and um, basically, we see an interesting picture where broadcasters come up top, followed by newspapers, followed by the category we had of news providers from outside the UK. News-related blogs, Facebook and Twitter are very low. Now, 
There's a paradox here, because elsewhere in this rather long and detailed report, lots and lots of people are finding news through social media and blogs. It's a really important way into news, but if you ask them what they trust, traditional new media come up higher. I suspect if you ask them about their favorite blog, you'd get a different answer, and they'd say they trust that a lot. But this is, these are generic questions, not favorite questions. I'll just show two, uh, two slides about engagement, uh, different forms of engagement with news, and then I'll wrap up. So we asked how many people were commenting. Uh, we did a whole lot of questions about <coughs> engagement with news, commenting on news, and so on. And this is a particular question. How many people commented on a, social, on, a, on a news story via a social network each week? What percentage of the population did? Once again, huge variations. Brazil on the left, we just did our survey in urban Brazil. 38% of people we surveyed in Brazil had commented via a social network on a news story, which is extraordinary. This is just urban Brazil quite a young population. You move to the right and look at Japan, 7% um, in Japan, 8% in Germany, UK 10%, US 21% there. So that's just one aspect. And so I suppose the whole issue, you know, we're talking about academic blogging here. I suppose what I'm trying to say is degrees of engagement with news and cont contributing to news vary hugely in different cultures in different countries. And just my penultimate slide, this gives you a whole lot of the different categories we looked at have you, of, of ways of sharing, commenting, and um, creating news. Have you shared news via email? Have you shared it via a social network? Have you written a blog? And basically, I've highlighted two categories of countries, really. What you see is you see all the figures are much higher in Spain and Italy than uh, UK, Germany, France, and Denmark. They're also high in US and urban Brazil. And um, if you look where we are in the UK, um, only one percent of our people have written a blog on a news on a news issue in the last. Um, this is a question. Um, yeah, only one percent of them said they had. Um, so you have relatively low levels of engagement. So we had a bit of debate as we were writing this report: is the glass half full or is it half empty? Should we be amazed at how many people are contributing and engaging, or should we be surprised, <coughs> given this fact, the fact that this is a survey only of people who are online and interested in news? in the UK and these figures are quite low. So, um, some, just to sort of draw this together and draw some conclusions. So, we said at the beginning that if you're interested in reaching other academic specialists, I think academic blogging is a great thing to do and much better than um, just relying on journal articles as we heard before. If you want to be, kind of, get to those mediators, what I call the generalist intermediaries, it's also great there. I think if you want to hit the mass market, if, you know, uh, if you're looking at Nate Silver, think again. Uh, Nate Silver is quite an unusual kind of blogger. Um, you know, he forecast his uh, first election and did it sort of pretty near down right. Then he was on the New York Times for the second election. Now he's, um, now he's sort of independent again, pretty much. But, so I suppose it depends what you're trying to target. And you need to be aware that mass media still matter most, in my opinion, for most people. But there are great opportunities to exploit niche markets, focus on some of these different intermediaries, and also seize every opportunity for when your topic is the flavor of the month. How many people in this room knew anybody who was working on the Ukraine two months ago? I suspect very few. Every journalist at the moment wants to, yes, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Every journalist at the moment wants to know where you are and how to find you. And um, if you've got a decent blog, it's a downside easier to find you now than it was. Okay.